Cassette two, side two. Practice test four. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your question booklet. Section one. Two students meet on the university campus. They start a conversation together. First, look at questions one to five. For each of the questions, four alternatives are given. Decide which of the alternatives A, B, C, or D best fits what you hear on the tape, and circle the appropriate letter. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Excuse me. Um, can you help me? I was looking for the main hall. No, maybe I can actually. I'm looking for the main hall too.、Uh, I think it's in the administration building. Are you a new student? Yeah, I am. The man says he's looking for the main hall too, so A has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully to the first conversation, and answer questions one to five. Excuse me. Um, can you help me? I was looking for the main hall. No, maybe I can actually. I'm looking for the main hall too.、Uh, I think it's in the administration building. Are you a new student? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I thought you looked as lost as me.、Uh, I'm trying to find the admin building too, so that I can register for my course. I don't seem to be having much luck. Well, um, look. According to this map of the campus here, you go straight up the steps,、uh -huh. turn left, and the building's on the right. Okay, let's see if we can find it. Ah,、oh, this looks right. Yeah, yeah, it must be. Look, there are hundreds of other people here.、Oh, there must be at least fifty people in the queue. We'll be here till gone two o'clock at this rate. Yeah, and I'm starving. So am I. Actually, I was on my way to the canteen to get something for lunch. Hey, why don't I go to the canteen and buy something, and you stay here and wait? Good idea. What would you like? Pizza, sandwich, hot dog. Fried rice—they do everything. Oh, something easy. Take away fried rice sounds good. Okay, fried rice. No, no. On, on second thoughts, I'll have a cheese and tomato sandwich. Right, one cheese and tomato. Anything to drink? Yeah, give me coffee, would you? Ah,、uh, hot coffee's a bit hard to carry. What about a coke or an orange juice? Um, get me an orange juice then. Look, here's five dollars. Oh, yeah. Take two dollars back. Shouldn't cost me more than three dollars. Well, get the five. We'll sort it out later. Oh, and could you get me an apple as well? Okay, back in a minute. The woman speaks to the clerk about registering at university. Look at questions six to ten. As you listen, complete the form by filling in the numbered spaces six to ten.
Oh, hello. I'm here to register for the first year law course. Oh, I'll just have to fill out this form for our records. Um, what's your name? Julia Perkins. Can you spell that for me? Yeah, that's um, J-U-L-I-A-P-E-R-K-I-N-S. Um, address? Flat 5, 15 Waratah Road. That's W-A-R-A-T-A-H, Brisbane. Brisbane. Oh, and your telephone number? Oh, we haven't got the phone on yet. We've only just moved in. OK, well... Can you let us have the number once the phone's connected? And I'll make a note here uh, to be advised. Uh, and the course? Beg your pardon? What course are you doing? Oh, um, first year law. Right. Well, you'll have to go across to the law faculty and get this card stamped and then you come back here with it and pay your union fee. Oh, thanks very much. The man and the woman meet up again, look at questions 11 and 12, and circle the correct answer. Oh, there you are. Oh, I thought you were never going to come back. <laughs> Sorry, the canteen was absolutely packed and I had to wait for ages. And then when I got to the front of the queue, there had hardly any food left, so I had to get you a slice of pizza. Sorry. Oh, that's OK. I could eat anything. I'm so hungry. Oh, and there's your bottle of orange juice and your apple. At least I managed that. Great. Thanks a lot. Oh, and here's your $2 back. Don't worry about it. Buy me a cup of coffee later. Oh, all right then. So how'd you go? Oh, well, in order to register, we've got to go to the law faculty and get this card stamped, and then go back to the admin building and pay the union fees. That means we're registered. Mm -hmm. After that, we have to go to the notice board to find out about lectures, and then we have to put our names down for tutorial groups and go to the library to... <laughs> Oh, no, great. Well, well, first, let's sit down and have our lunch, eh? <laughs> That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a talk about banks in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 17. Now listen to the talk and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces 13 to 17. Uh, OK, um, right. Uh, thanks for turning up today. Thanks for turning up today to this short talk I'm going to give on student banking. Uh, many of you are unfamiliar with the way banks work in this country, and today's talk should just give you a few starting points. Uh, I will, of course, answer any questions at the end. Right. Well, as you probably know, you'll need to open a bank account while you're here. Um, it's the safest place to keep your money. And it's best to open an account with one of the major banks. You should each have a handout with the names and addresses. Yeah? Right. There's, um, there's Barclays in Realty Square, National Westminster in Preston Park, 
Lloyd's in City Plaza, and Midland in Hope Street. OK, all these books offer special student accounts. However, it's important to note that as an international student, you'll not necessarily be eligible for all the facilities offered to resident students. Now, as an international student, you will need to provide evidence that you can fund yourself for however long your course lasts. Um, banks have different policies, and the services that they'll offer you will depend on your individual circumstances and on the discretion of the bank manager involved. So um, it's a matter of going there and finding out about your own particular situation. Right. Um, when you do go to open a bank account, you should take some documentation with you. Uh, I've already mentioned that you must be able to support yourself. I in addition to this, most banks ask you to bring your passport and your letter or certificate of enrolment. OK? Now, by far the most useful type of account to open is a current account. When you do this, you will actually get what is called a student account, which is a current account with special concessions for students. When you open the account, the bank will give you a checkbook and you can use this to draw money out as you need it. If you need to write cheques in shops, you'll also need a cheque card. This is really an identity card, which guarantees that correctly written cheques up to the value stated on the card will be honoured by the bank. OK? Everybody with me so far? Now look at questions 18 to 21. As you listen to the rest of the talk, complete the rest of the notes in the spaces numbered 18 to 21. Right, uh, if you want to draw out cash for yourself, you can make the cheque payable in your own name or to cash. Mm -hmm. You can also withdraw cash from a cash point machine with a cash card. Now, these are extremely useful as they enable you to withdraw cash from your account during the day or at night. Um, there is also another card called Switch or Delta and you can use this to pay for things in shops. Um, it takes the money right out of your account so you don't need your checkbook. Now, you may want to take more money out of the bank than you have in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is called having an overdraft. Be very careful with this. You should not do this without permission from your bank. Overdrafts usually incur charges, though some banks offer interest-free overdrafts to some students. But find out before you get one, right? <laughs> Well, that just leaves opening times. <laughs> when can you go? Banks used to be open from 9.30am until 3.30pm from Monday to Friday. But many main branches are now open until 4.30 or 5pm on weekdays. And some of the bigger branches in London and other major cities are now open for a limited time on Saturdays. OK, um, any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. 
Two students, Dawn and Ilmar, are discussing a project that they are working on together. First, you have some time to look at questions 22 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and complete the fact sheet by filling in the numbered spaces 22 to 25. Hi Dawn. Oh, hi Ilma. I'm glad I've bumped into you. I've just found a great idea for the presentation we've got to do for Dr Banks next month. What, the one on everyday objects? Yes, look at this article. It's really interesting. Uh... The aluminium Coke can? You know, Coca-Cola cans, soft drink cans. Look, let's sit down here. Have you got a minute? Sure. I'll just get my bag. OK. So, you think we can get a presentation out of this article? I'm sure we can. First of all, we can provide some interesting facts about the aluminium cans that we drink out of every day. Like? Well, here it says that in the US they produce 300 million aluminium drink cans each day. Wow! 300 million? Exactly. That's an enormous number. Mm. It says here, outstrips the production of nails or paper clips. <laughs> and they say that the manufacturers of these cans exercise as much attention and precision in producing them as aircraft manufacturers do when they make the wing of an aircraft. Really? <laughs> Let's have a look. They're trying to produce the perfect can, as thin but as strong as possible. Hmm. This bit's interesting. Today's can weighs about 0.48 ounces, thinner than two pieces of paper, from this magazine, say. Yeah, and yet it can take a lot of weight. More than 90 pounds of pressure per square inch. Three times the pressure of a car tyre. <sighs> OK, I agree. It's a good topic. Now look at the diagram of the aluminium can and at questions 26 to 31. As the conversation continues, label the can by completing the notes in the numbered spaces 26 to 31. What I thought was that we could do a large picture of a Coke can and label it and then talk about the different parts. Look, I've done a rough picture here. OK, so where shall we start? Well. The lid is complicated. Mm. Let's start with the body first. I'll do a line from the centre of the can, like this, and label it body. What does it say? It's made of aluminium, of course, and it's thicker at the bottom. Right, so that it can take all that pressure. And then I think you should draw another line from the body for the label. Right, label. The aluminium is ironed out until it's so thin that it produces... Oh, what does it say? Uh, a reflective surface suitable for decoration. That's right. Apparently it helps advertisers too. Yes, because it's so attractively decorated. Good. And then there's the base. Yes, it says the bottom of the can is shaped like a dome so that it can resist the internal pressure. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Nor did I. OK, so going up to the lid, there are several things we can label here. There's the rim around the edge, which seals the can. Got that. 
And there's a funny word for the seal, isn't there? Yes. It's a flange. What does it say about it? Well, the can's filled with coke or whatever, and after that the top of the can is trimmed and then bent over to secure the lid. That's right. It looks like a seam. We could blow up like this. F L A N G E. Yes, that would be clearer. I think we should label the lid itself and say that it constitutes 25% of the total weight. 25%? Mm. So it's stronger than the body of the can. Mm. So to save money, manufacturers make it smaller than the rest of the can. Didn't know that either. So, how do we open a can of Coke? Hmm. First of all, there's the tab, which we pull up to open the can, and that's held in place by a rivet. Hmm. I think that's too small for us to include. I agree. But we can talk about it in the presentation. We can show the opening, though. That's the bit of the can that drops down into the drink when we pull the tab. Yeah, hopefully. Sometimes the tab just breaks off. I know. Anyway, the opening is scored so that it pushes in easily but doesn't detach itself. OK. We can show that by drawing a shadow of it inside the can. Like this. Mm. I'll label it scored opening. Great. Well... I think we've got the basis of a really interesting presentation. Mm. Let's go and photocopy the article. Fine. I'll take it home and study it some more. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear part of a short university lecture. First, look at questions 32 to 42. Now listen and complete the lecture notes in the spaces numbered 32 to 42. Uh, good morning and welcome to the university's open day and to our mini lecture from the sports studies department. Now, the purpose of this lecture is twofold. One, we want you to experience a university lecture to give you a taste of what listening to a university lecture is like. And two, we want you to find something about the sports studies program at this university. So feel free to ask any questions during the talk and I'll do my best to answer them. <clears throat> right, so what does a course in sports studies involve? Well, you wouldn't be blamed for not knowing the answer to this question because sports studies as a discipline is still comparatively new. But it's a growing area and one which is now firmly established at our university. Now, there are three distinct strands to sports studies, and you'd need to choose fairly early on just which direction you wanted to follow. And I'll just run over these now. Firstly, we've got the sports psychology strand. Secondly, we've got the sports management strand. And last but not least, there's the sports physiology strand. So just to recap, there's sports psychology, sports management, and sports physiology. 
Uh, let's look first at psychology. Now, the people who study sports psych want to work with top athletes, and they're looking at what will take those athletes that 1% extra. What makes them win? When all other things are equal, physically all other things are equal, they want to know what are the mental factors involved. The sports psychologist works closely with the athlete through his or her training program and becomes an integral part of the team. In fact, you could say that they play just as important a role as the coach. So if you're interested in what makes people win, this could be the area for you. Now secondly, we've got the strand which I refer to as sports management. And this goes hand in hand with the area of sports marketing. So you might like to think of this area as having two branches management and marketing. On the management side, we look at issues relating to the running of sports clubs, management of athletes, that sort of thing. But then on the other side, we've got sports marketing. And this is the side that interests me more, because here we will look at the market forces behind sport. Questions like, why do people spend their money on a football match or a tennis game, rather than, say, on buying a CD or going to the cinema? What are those market forces? Sport used to just compete with sport. Nowadays, it competes with other leisure activities. The spectators go to sport to be entertained rather than out of loyalty to a team. They want to have an evening out and they don't want the cheap seats anymore. They want good seats. They want entertainment. And the professional sportsmen and women respond to this without question. They are there to give a performance. They provide the entertainment. So in the marketing course, we address all these commercial issues and we look at how this hooks back into the management of sport. Now the third branch of sports studies sometimes comes under another name and is also known as exercise science. And in here we find that there are two distinct types of exercise science. The first is working very much at the macro level, what I call huffing and puffing people. So this looks at fitness testing, body measurement, all that sort of thing. But the more interesting side of sports physiology, at least in my view, is the side that's at the micro level, looking at cellular change. They're doing cellular research, looking at changes in body cells when the body is under stress. So that just about brings us to the end of our mini lecture for today. I hope you found it interesting, and I look forward to seeing you all on our course next year. But feel free to come and talk to me if you want any more information. Um, I'll be over at that notice board near the main entrance. Thank you very much. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.